uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Uh, for the lesson this morning, on the subject of remembering that we're not alone. You know, it is a truth that you and I can get to the place in our lives where we think, um, where we, where we think the world centers on us, especially if we're going through something painful, something difficult. Um, uh, very often when a person is going through something really difficult or painful in their life, they do tend to just start uh, narrowing in their focus and narrowing in their focus and they begin to think about themselves and, you know, and be, you know, they're concentrating so much on their own trials and their own difficulties and, and so forth that they forget that there are others out there. That happens pretty often, very, very frequently um, when um, I'll be speaking with someone uh, who's gone through a tragedy or a trial or some kind of difficulty, they're in the middle of some kind of difficulty, very frequently um, they will express something like this, I know other people have been tried, but no one has been tried like me. Very often they'll do that, you know. Um, what I've gone through, no one else in the whole world, in the 6,000 years of history, the 7 billion people that live on the planet right now, no one has experienced what I've experienced. And we sometimes get that way in our lives where we start thinking, you know, we're alone. Remember, um, Elijah comes to that place in his life, you know, God, I only have not forsaken you. God says, well, wait a minute, no, I want, I've reserved to myself 400 others. You think you're alone, but you're not alone. We're not alone. And uh, I'm speaking today, I want to speak today especially about the fact that we're not alone in a local church. Um, we're not the only local church, and we're not the only people that are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded of that in the Apostle Paul's words here in verses 15 and 16. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. Now the letter that he's writing, this is a church, he's writing and addressing a church in Colossae. And uh, he, is, he is addressing problems that have gone on in the city of Colossae, the church in the city of Colossae. And he is, uh, he is speaking to this one church in the city of Colossae. But now that he comes to the end of it, he says, oh, and I want to remind you that there's another church just down the road in another town called Laodicea. And I want you to rem remember that you're not alone, that while you're in Colossae serving the Lord Jesus Christ and, and you've got trials and struggles and you've got things where you're standing for the Lord, I want you to remember that there are others who are doing the very same thing in other places and you can benefit from them and they can benefit from you. And so he mentions in verses 15 and 16 a uh, four different uh, categories, I think I'm going to call it, of, um, of, uh, of, of those who are outside the church at Colossae. Number one, he mentions, uh, he mentions a particular man. In verse 15, he calls him, he just says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus. That's a particular man. Now, um, <clears throat> And I don't know how important this is going to be for you to hear all this kind of stuff. I'll tell you this. Uh, some commentators say that Nymphus is not a man, it's a woman. And, and they get that because of the A at the end of the, the word. Um, it, uh, that it's pretty easy to figure out that it is a man because it says, and the church which is in <clears throat> his house. So as far as I know, most of the time uh, when a woman is addressed, she, it, she is called a she and not a he. And most of the time. And so I'm pretty sure that Nymphus here is a man. And some people say, well, that's because this is a shorter, contracted part of the name or something like that is how that happens. But he's only mentioned, the interesting thing about, uh, about, uh, about Nymphus is he's only mentioned this one time in all of the Bible. I'm reminded of what Brother Johnston, one the message that he preached on Sunday night uh, on what about her. And he, he you know, spoke about the fact that her is only mentioned, the man is only mentioned six times in all of the Bible. But Israel would have been destroyed in the wilderness had it not been for this one man who seems insignificant. He's only mentioned six times in the Bible. And, and here's Nymphus. He has only mentioned this one time in the Word of God. In fact, we only know two things about him based on what is found in this passage. We know, number one, that he lives in the city of Laodicea. 
We know that he lives in the city of Laodicea. Now, uh, because of that, there's some other um, speculations that, I, if, that I, I could probably make if I chose to do so based upon Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 gives us some information about the church that is in the city of Laodicea. And, and uh, I'm going to avoid the speculations and kind of stay away from that today uh, and for a couple of reasons. I'm going to avoid them for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you know, we think about Laodicea. It was the lukewarm church, you know, and uh, Jesus is going to spit them out of his mouth and spew them out of his mouth. Uh, I'm going to avoid, I, I don't know that that's true of Nephis for a couple of reasons. The church, in, we, don't, and we have no evidence that the church of Laodicea is lukewarm at the time when the Apostle Paul is writing this letter. Uh, when when um, Jesus spoke those words to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, it's around 90 A.D. Uh, the book of Colossians is closer to uh, 65 to 67 A.D. And a lot happens in 30-year period of time. And so uh, we don't know that the church at Laodicea is a lukewarm church when the Apostle Paul writes these words. We don't know that. And even if the church at Laodicea is lukewarm uh, already, we don't know that Nymphus is one of those who is lukewarm in the church uh, you know uh, even in in the in the worst of churches there are people who want to serve God in the most liberal of churches there are people who understand truth and, and desire truth and and uh, and want the truth now, I think they should come out of that church and find themselves a place where the Word of God is preached but uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not good people and uh, and and doing the very best that they can where they are I, I did a uh, I was I was with a, this summer I, I did a I did a, a, a wedding that was held in a, a church in downtown Tacoma and uh, um, and so the the people the the wedding that I was doing they weren't members of that church they just rented the facility it's a big 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 building downtown Tacoma and um, and this old big church that used to run you know in the several hundreds and now runs you know uh, in the in the forty and fifty number forty or fifty people come on Sunday mornings in order to pay for the building they rent out some of it to an art studio they rent and then they rent it out for weddings and other uses like that. Uh, some a local um, a local orchestra performs there, some things like that. Anyway, so after the fun after the funeral, after the wedding is over, uh, um, we go down. There's a reception, and um, there's a there's a couple that had uh, from the church that had an elderly couple from the church who had been hired. Uh, their job was to open the doors and clean up and make sure everyone knew where everything was for the wedding and so forth. And so at the reception, they were invited to the reception. They sat down at the table with Anita and I. And, uh, and so they started asking about our church and about Bible Baptist Church. And they said, oh, yeah, when we started here, this was a Baptist church. It was a church where they met and married um, 50 years ago. Um, he was a soldier that came to the area. And she was a, a, a girl, a young girl in that church. And they met at a function at that church, met there and got married. After he got out of the military, they moved back and they stayed. They raised their children in that church, you know, and, and, and that was where they were from. And, and uh, anyway, so and he's, he's asking us about our church and, you know, we're Baptist church. Yeah, well, our, we used, our church used to be Baptist. And you could tell by the way they said it that they wished it still was, you know. We used to be Baptists, <laughs> and and, uh, and then you know he asked some other questions, and uh, yeah, we have Sunday night service. Yeah, we used to have Sunday night services. Wednesday night, we used to have Wednesday night services, and he'd go. He went through this whole thing about all this this whole and 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 what I I, I came away from that. I told any there's a couple whose church um, outran them. And it's where they raised their kids. It's where they were married. It's where they raised their kids. It's where they've dedicated their lives. And, and the church changed, sometimes gradually and not so gradually. And, and, and it's, it's where all of their memories are, but it's not what it used to be. And they still are what they used to be, but nothing around them is the same. Do you ever feel like that ha is happening to you? Where the world is changing around you and, and, and you know where you are is the right place to be. I'm not talking about a physical location, but spiritually, you know that your doctrines and your, and your, your standards and everything is right where it should be. But the world is changing so quickly around you, you feel like you've been left alone. And, and, uh, uh, and maybe Nymphus was one of those that, uh, you know, and that, that he's, he's right where he ought to be, but the church in La 
Laodicea changes into something else as the years go by. We don't know that he is either lukewarm, and we don't know that the church is lukewarm at that time. Uh, we just know that he is, he is from Laodicea, that, he's, that he lives in the city of Laodicea. And we know, secondly, that the church that meets in, that the church in Laodicea meets in his house. It's in his home. Now that would really mess you up if your church goes bad and it's meeting in your home. That would be kind of a tough spot there. Um, by the way, this doesn't mean he's the pastor. In fact, it almost certainly means he is not the pastor. That the church meets in his house almost certainly means that he's not the pastor. Um, in, in, in this early, the first century, second century, and third century, um, it was so dangerous to be a Christian and especially to be a pastor of a Christian church that, um, that pastors very seldom uh, owned property, very seldom even had a house to rent it. They, they very seldom even rented a house. They stayed with families families in the church and, and uh, the pastor and his family would move from house to house and from home to home to avoid being captured and uh, because it was so very dangerous for them um, they, they had to always be very fluid and mobile and so forth and so very likely uh, Nymphus is not the, the pastor of the church uh, at all but it does tell me something about the character of the man that he that the church meets in his house shows me a few things tells me some things about the kind of man he is number one it tells me you know to, to ha let the house let the church meet in your house that is a very generous thing to do and I understand that houses back in that day are not the same as houses are in our day but I do also understand that to have a church meet in your home is um, to really invade your personal space it really invades your personal pain. The first church I went to, Baptist church I went to, it was 10 people meeting in the pastor's living room. And so every Sunday morning, pastor would take his living room couch, he would slide it against the wall, he would set up uh, several rows of uh, folding chairs in his living room, and he'd bring out of wherever he kept it, the pulpit, and he'd set it out there in, in his living room, and then his kitchen became a Sunday school classroom, his bedroom became a Sunday school classroom, his children's bedrooms became Sunday school classrooms, and those kind of things. And then after, and then you've got all these people who are just in your home, they're using your bathroom, they're going into your kitchen, they're going, using you know and and you know they're just they're just they make your house um, their house for however long services are and, and 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 the longer that goes on the more people feel the longer a church meets in a person's house the more comfortable people feel like uh, with the things in the house being theirs and and so forth so to have a church and by the way in these days you didn't meet in a home as a place to start the church in those days churches didn't I mean, they weren't in a position financially and, um, uh, can't think of the right, it wasn't safe. They, they would never have been able to buy a building and meet in a building in those days because they were constantly being hunted. They couldn't have, uh, you know, actually purchased a piece of property, built a building and met in that uh, building at this time. It wouldn't have been practical to do in, that, in these days because it was just so dangerous to be a Christian. And so for a church to meet in someone's house, that was a long term commitment it's a long-term kind of thing so it's very generous that Nymphus is allowing uh, the church to meet in house it's a very generous thing it's also a very obvious thing as I'm saying implying that there's a lot of danger involved in being a Christian and being the kind of being the Christian who has the church meeting in your house is really uh, um, you know I mean that's going to make it very obvious who you are and that you are a believer and remember and not, not this didn't happen all the time or everywhere but there were periods of time where what they do is someone all they'd have to do is accuse you of being a Christian and the government would just come in and take everything you own throw you in jail and the person who accused you of being a Christian owns everything that you own it's a given to them for turning you you in and so it's a very dangerous and obvious thing that he's doing it's also a commitment thing for him to to have you know allow the church to meet in his house uh, it's a commitment thing it's uh, he doesn't get to he doesn't get to quit church uh, very easily because <laughs> the church meets in his house he doesn't get to go change churches the church is meeting his house. He didn't get to, well, I got mad at my pastor, or I got mad at a Sunday school teacher, or someone didn't shake my hand, or someone didn't smile at me, or someone did smile at me. I actually had a family quit the church in that story one time because we did smile. It was during the Lord's Supper. And they didn't think it was appropriate to be happy at the Lord's Supper. And so they actually quit the church because, you know, they thought we were being flippant because we smiled and, uh, at, during the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and uh, you know, but the, the Memphis doesn't get to quit for anything. 
It's meeting in his house. They're not, he doesn't get to quit. Uh, so there's a commitment that goes on there. So there's Nymphus, a man, not in the town of Colossae, but there is a guy in another town in Laodicea, and the Apostle Paul says, hey, I want you to remember this man. Say hi to him, this man, in another town, in another church. Say hi to him. Then not only is there a man, but there's also a people uh, that he references in verse 15. He says, salute the brethren. He mentioned the brethren. Salute the brethren um, which are in Laodicea. And uh, now, I, I think it's important. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this thing, the idea of the brethren. So by using that, he's, he's, he's making a relationship. More than just we're all members of the human race, uh, he's speaking about brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ here. So there are some brothers and sisters in Christ who are live in a different town and who attend a different church than, uh, than the people here in the city of Colossae. Um, you know, I am convinced, uh, I, I'm very much a local church man. I, I, am, I am convinced that there is no other sort of church found in the Bible than a, than a local church. There is no such thing as a universal invisible church that everyone who's been born again belongs to. There's nothing like that taught in the Bible. Uh, that idea, w once a person has that idea implanted into their head, it's possible to extract a couple of verses in the Bible and say, well, see right there, that's a universal church. But when you read the Bible for what it says, everything in the Bible speaks about the church being a local congregation. There is a church in Laodicea. There is a church in Colossae, and they are not the same church. I, I'm very convinced that there's no other sort of church in the Bible than a local church. I am certain that every Christian ought to be a member of a local church. I am committed to the doctrine that every ministry ought to be done under a local church. I, I believe all of those things. On the other hand, I do think it's important for us to recognize that there are people who are not members of this church who are still brothers and sisters sisters in the Lord. Just because a person isn't in this church doesn't mean we're the only people who are right with God or serving God or living for the Lord. We are not alone. We're not alone. And we have a bond with Christians who, for all sorts of reasons, aren't members of this church. Um, they live in a different town. They live in a different state. They live in a different country. They live wherever they are. And, uh, but for whatever reasons, they're, they're members of a church in another location. And, and there is still a, a, a relationship, a bond with them. Now, that bond... Uh, doesn't mean that, um, you know, just because I have a bond with someone doesn't mean that I grant them full access to the privileges of church. Um, I have some very, very close friends, uh, pastors of other churches, independent Baptist pastors. Uh, their doctrine is, is, uh, is very similar to mine, very same, very much the same. We are friends. We do a lot of things together. We uh, have stood together uh, for the Lord in some, uh, some tough situations and so forth. I love them. I like being around them a lot. I like visiting with them and fellowshipping with them. But um, when our church takes the Lord's Supper, I would, do not invite them to attend. Because the Lord's Supper is a local church thing. By the way, those friends that I'm talking about, they wouldn't, um, if I did invite them, they would uh, decline anyway. Because they know it's a local church thing. And, and, and now that ought not, the concept of how I can be, how someone can be my brother and yet be excluded from some things that happen in a local church, it really shouldn't be that difficult to understand. I have um, one half brother, I have, I have two brothers, a half brother and a whole brother, and then I have um, three sisters. Uh, two full sisters and a half sister, um, and they are family, and I love them very dearly. And I'd love for them to ha um, I'd love for them to come. None of them ever have, but I'd love for them to come and to visit. They would be welcome to come in my home and to visit, and uh, you know, and, and be around me and so forth. But uh, none of them have a key to my house, or ever are going to get a key to my house. Um, they aren't welcome to just walk into my house any time. It's my house. It's not their house. They're family, and I love them. But I would not let any one of my brothers or sisters just go into my house, walk in, open the refrigerator, say, what's for supper? You know, those are all things family do. You know, you come into the house, you know, the, uh, a, a family unit. They, they walk in the house and, uh, and, and, and they sit around a table and they have a meal together. And, but and when others must be invited, including my brother, my sisters. They must be invited to come and sit at that table. They don't just walk in and say, man, I'm hungry. What's for dinner tonight? They must be invited to that table. And, uh, and come, the fact is, at this point, my two sons, um, while 
in my opinion, I would just I would I would like for them to think they do have keys to my house. I would like for them to think that they're welcome to step into my house at any time and say, "What's for supper?" Um, they know they don't they understand that that once they got married and moved out, that something happens, and it's not the same. Their relation, I love them dearly, but it's not the same anymore. There's a, there's a separation. There's a change. And, and that's exactly the same way it is with, with, uh, with, with Christian doctrine in, in local churches. People who are members of this church enjoy privileges in this church that people who are not members of this church do not enjoy. It's not that we love them less. It's not that we don't wish them the best and we want the, and, but, but it is not the same as being a member of this local church. And, and, uh, and, and they understand that too because they're members of local churches and they understand that I don't have the same privileges in their church that I have in this one and that they have in, in their local church and so forth. Uh, uh, so brethren, he says there are some, some brethren uh, uh, out there. Enjoy, he says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. And then he mentions not only a man, Nymphus, and then uh, some people, the brethren that are in the, there. He mentions the church itself. In verses, it, 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 the word church is found in both 15 and 16. Uh, and the church which is in his house, and when this epistle read, is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And so he mentions the church that is in Laodicea here in, in these two passages, and these two verses of Scripture as well. Now, this this is one of the many places in the Bible that we learn the nature of, of the church as it's found in the Word of God. Uh, and especially speaking about it being a local church. Notice that there is a church in Colossae, that's the letter is written to, but there's also a church in the city of Laodicea. They're not the same church. Uh, and he, I mean, he points it out very clearly here. He says, now, I want you who are of Colossae, I want you to salute the brethren that are members of that church that is in Laodicea. It's a different church. It's not the same church. They're, they're, they're brethren one with another, but the, the, their church is not the same church. And, and, um, and they were not members of the same church. The people in Laodicea, the people in Colossae, they're not members of the same church. Each church had its own place to meet. Each church had its own pastor. Each church had its own problems, um, which is very clear when you come to the book of Revelation. I've mentioned that a little bit. Revelation chapters 2 and 3, seven churches are mentioned there, the seven churches in Asia, and are mentioned uh, Laodicea being one of them and all of them are independent churches all of them are local churches in different towns all of them have different strengths and all of them have different weaknesses and different problems that they're facing uh, one of them is going through a revival period the, the church in Laodicea they're going through a revival period and and great things are happening there but another one the church in Smyrna they're going through a period of terrible persecution at the very same time one of them is in that place where Satan seeks dwells and another one is going through this great revival happening at the very same time churches uh, they're, they're each local churches and and each one of them has its has its own personality its own issues and things that are going on and yet even though each church is unique and different in a different location it is interesting here and this is a characteristic of the Bible that one portion of the Bible that's good for Colossae will also be good for Laodicea now he mentions the letter that's written to the Laodiceans. What it reminds us of is the fact that the Word of God is an inspired book. Not every letter that was written, not everything that Paul wrote or anyone else wrote in those days was automatically considered the Word of God. But there were particular documents, letters, books that were written by different men that God breathed. He used them to 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 breathe out his word and not everything the apostle paul was was the breath of god some things were and some things were not some people they come up with you know you get the newsweek and the magazines and archaeologists they'll say well we found a brand new bible book of the bible and uh you know book of thomas i think was one that came out not too long or a few, you know, what, 20 30 years ago uh and uh wow and it tells us all brand new things we're learning totally that the bible is completely taken wrong because now we have this brand new well no that someone wrote an uh, an epistle that uh and used the name thomas that's probably very 
very likely the Apostle Paul. We know he wrote things more than what are found in the Bible, but there are only certain things that he wrote that God directed and that God preserved and that God saw to it that it was put together in a book like this. And, uh, but the Word of God, here's the thing about it. The Word of God that was good for Colossae was good for Laodicea, and it's good for Puyallup. It was good in the first century, and it was good for the churches in the 5th century and all of those in between. And it was good for the churches in the 16th century and it's good for the churches in the 21st century. It never changes. And uh, what was good for one is going to be good uh, for all of them. That word of God is that way. So the letter to the church, I, well, I already said that. The letter of the church at Colossae is a blessing to the church at Laodicea. The letter of the church of Ephesus is a blessing to the church at Colossae. And all of these letters will be a blessing to you and me. Now, notice fourthly, there's a man, there's a people, there's a church. And then the fourth thing is, uh, he mentions the city, the city of Laodicea here uh, in this passage. Uh, Brethren which are in Laodicea. Laodicea, uh, verse 16, the Laodiceans. And what I want to do kind of right here is I want to focus on verse 16, that phrase, um, the Laodiceans. Now he mentions it, he says, uh, uh, I'll read it to you, and when this epistle be read, is read among you, cause that it also, that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So he's speaking about, the, you know, the church of the Laodiceans, but, but my thoughts right now, I want to focus um, on a different group of people in Laodicea, those who were not in the church. Um, those who are not Christians, not saved, not going to heaven when they die. There's a church in Laodicea, and there are citizens of the city of Laodicea that are members of that church, but there are also people that are in that city who are not um, saved yet, and they're not in that church. You know, it is, I think it's healthy and it's wise for us to, well, I'm supposed to switch this down. I think it's healthy and it's wise for us to remember that there are other Christians besides uh, those in our church. I think that's very wise for us and healthy for us to do, to remember that we're not alone. It can cheer us and encourage us. It's an encouragement that happens to realize that we're not alone that way, but while it's healthy and wise for us to remember that there are other Christians out there, it is essential for us to remember that there are people who are not Christians. It is essential for us to remember that as believers, we owe a debt to those who are not believers. We owe it to those who are not saved to try to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ, to try to reach them. Uh, we owe it to them to have our eyes focused on seeing them and to have our hearts burdened for their salvation and to have our mouths kind of uh, focused in on witnessing the word of God to them and preaching the word of God to them rather than, you know, telling, um, you know, negative things and so forth. But rather than being a gossip or a whiner or a complainer or a murmur, but to give them the gospel, we owe it to them to remember that they need to be saved.